Hello, this is Family Law Lecture number 20, the first of our revision lectures. As you can hopefully tell from the voice, this is Helen rather than um, Jeff or James giving the lecture. So if you have any specific questions about the contents, then please feel free to email me helen.hall, H-A-L-L, -L, at ntu.ac.uk. It will also be helpful for you if you can see whilst you're listening the Word document which has been uploaded to the learning room for this lecture specifically. The topic today is going to be nullity, um, the one which we covered right at the beginning of the course, partly because it's good to go back to the start. It's been a long time since we were there way back in autumn but partly as well as I warned there might be, the law has changed a little bit. There have been some interesting developments, nothing too major as you'll see, so please don't panic, but there is an update I'd like to give you in relation to non-marriage and void marriage and the ACTAR case. We'll get there in a little while though. First of all, I want to give you a general overview about nullity and also how its place fits within the formation of a marriage. Now, traditionally, attempts to contract a marriage can be classified into four different categories. First of all, there's the concept of non-marriage. This is where a ceremony or an event could not be categorized as a genuine attempt to contract a marriage which was binding in the law of England and Wales. So the parties might theoretically think that they were marrying as far as they were concerned emotionally or spiritually, but they are not trying, they are not taking any steps to make it the kind of marriage which state law is going to pay any attention to. Uh, examples often given are actors in a play, um, possibly children playing a game, something very clearly uh, and very obvious. In case law, we also have examples of um, parties accompanied by a blessing, but occasions where people know very well that this is not a marriage. Please notice too um, that the Court of Appeal have recently criticised this term non-marriage as something they don't like, they don't find helpful, but we're going to go on and we're going to talk about that in a little while. Secondly, the second possibility is that of a void marriage. Now this is a genuine attempt to contract a marriage which is binding as far as the law of England and Wales is concerned. However, it is caught by one of the provisions of Section 11 of the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973. And this means that the purported marriage is void ab initio, i.e. it's void, it's not valid, it fails from the very beginning and it has no existence in law. Nevertheless, slightly Alice in Wonderland logic, even though it has no legal existence as a marriage, a void marriage is capable of having legal consequences. And the significance, particularly for us, is it is capable of triggering the provisions for financial relief, which you looked at in James's lectures. So it can be the gateway um, to financial help or protection for the parties to, to the relationship to the institution. So although a void marriage does not exist, it nevertheless is extremely significant. Third possible category, avoidable marriage. Now avoidable marriage is an attempt to contract a marriage which is binding according to the law of England and Wales but this time it's caught by one of the provisions of section 12 of the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973. And in this case, 
the marriage is valid and binding unless and until it is set aside. So if both of the parties are happy to carry on, nobody raises any um, problem or objection, then a voidable marriage will continue as a valid marriage. Also remember that even if one of the parties decides for whatever reason that they'd actually like out, there are some bars to relief. So it is not always possible, depending on the ground that the person is seeking to rely on and the time when they're seeking to rely on it, to extricate yourself, to get out of a voidable marriage. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It is a marriage which is flawed, but is valid unless and until it is set aside by a court. And then we have the fourth category, uh, a marriage without legal flaws. So here you have got a marriage where there is nothing which could be caught by section 11 or section 12. Um, the law of nullity will not apply to it and it can only be brought to an end by divorce or obviously by death, um, but you can't legally and legitimately seek to bring about the death of your partner. So essentially uh, you're looking for divorce as your only legitimate way out. Okay, so that's a brief and general summary of how the concept of nullity works. Uh, if some of those bits uh, were starting to feel a bit hazy and unfamiliar, obviously please do go back to the original lectures where we dealt with the topic in detail. The main meat of the session today, I'd like to talk about the update to the case which we last talked about at first instance as NA and MSK. It was decided in um, 2018 and the full reference is 2018 EWFC 54. This decision has now been reversed by the Court of Appeal. Now, going back to remind you of the original facts and the original ruling. The case concerned a couple who had been married in an Islamic ceremony, but had not had and had not attempted to go through any ceremony which was binding as far as the law of England and Wales were concerned. And both parties were aware that their Islamic marriage was not going to have any force within the law of England and Wales. They knew that. The original deal had been that afterwards they were going to go along to the registry office and have a civil, civil ceremony and deal with that aspect of it. However, in the event, I'm going to refer to the parties as husband and wife for the sake of convenience, but obviously bear in mind, in light of later findings, as far as secular law is concerned, that's not really what they were. The husband refused, however, to keep his promise. Uh, his wife begged, cajoled, um, pressured him for years and years, but he, always either came up with excuses or sometimes very aggressively refused. There was good evidence that it was um, an abusive relationship. The wife knew that she was in an extremely vulnerable legal position. Nevertheless, she was concerned about uh, her reputation within her community, uh, the consequences to her socially and in, in the fullness of time to her children if she were to attempt to leave her husband. So she stayed. They were together for a good number of years and they had three children in the time that they were together. Eventually, however, the wife got to the point where she did not wish to live with this any further and decided to leave her husband. It was at this stage, of course, that she was acutely aware that she had no um, legal protection, no legal rights above and beyond those which 
any cohabitant might have, so therefore, frankly, not a lot in England and Wales. So she attempted to argue that she had a void marriage. And surprisingly, it came as a shock to everyone, but the judge at first instance agreed. His reasoning was as follows. The wife, in her efforts to persuade her husband to finish the process which he had started and to go through with the civil ceremony that was always meant to be a part of what they were doing when they got married according to their um, religious law, amounted to a valid attempt to contract a legally binding marriage according to state law. In other words, the woman was trying to comply with the requirements of the 1949 Marriage Act and it was not her fault that her husband refused to cooperate. And the fact that she was trying to do what she knew she needed to, to go to the civil registrar and to, to contract the marriage was sufficient to justify saying this was a void marriage, it was a genuine attempt to marry and therefore to open the gateway for her to financial relief. This shocked everyone as a decision. Um, it was out of sync with both all previous case law and also with an ordinary um, reading of the statute according to basic principles of statutory interpretation um, that you, you know, learnt in your, your first year in the joys of legal method and that you're all very familiar with. So it's not a great shock that the Court of Appeal reversed this and basically found it to be wrong. This essentially is the reasoning of the Court of Appeal in reversing the decision. The Matrimonial Causes Act 1973, Section 11A3, states that a marriage is void where the parties have married in disregard of certain formalities. Now, the court ruled that this clearly referred to the formalities stipulated by the Marriage Act 1949. And the implication had to be that at least some of the formalities required by that act had been carried out. Otherwise, you are effectively going to say that almost any sort of rite or, or ceremony uh, which the parties are calling marriage and had a degree of formality could come in with the scope. It must surely refer only to marriages which were trying to come within the regulatory regime of the 1949 Act. It says some of the formalities were missing. It does not say all of the formalities were missing. And there was nothing which the husband and wife in this case had actually done which was an attempt to comply with those formalities. Simply persuading somebody or seeking to persuade somebody that he should comply with those formalities does not amount to two people getting together and actually trying, you know, going to the registrar, having a ceremony which they believe is going to be legally compliant in one way or another. Effectively, in saying that some form of ceremony, even a ceremony which was never intended nor believed to be one which was caught by the 1949 Act, could give rise to avoid marriage purely on the basis of things that one party had done after the event would mean that theoretically almost any religious marriage could be caught by the regime. 
And obviously, if you are going to let any form of ceremony through the door, you are completely undermining the protection that you get from having a statutory regulatory framework governing marriage. You'd be throwing the entirety of the 1949 Act out of the window if you say anyone can come along and claim a void marriage on the basis of a purely religious ceremony which they were a party to because they were hoping, believing that the other party would at some point go along and marry them in civil law. The court also stated that it found the term non-marriage an unhelpful way of describing ceremonies which didn't give rise even to a void marriage. And obviously uh, this is a good example and you can see why in this kind of case um, that might be uncomfortable terminology. It feels slightly disrespectful to refer to two people who'd been married according to their religion, who had at one time during their relationship lived in another jurisdiction where their Islamic marriage was recognised. Um, to label that relationship as a non-marriage seems confusing and inappropriate. And also, and I think this second point was more persuasive for the court, if you start talking about the relationship more widely, you take the focus away from the ceremony, which was the attempt to contract the marriage. The judge had effectively got distracted by thinking about things which had happened after that initial ceremony. And his focus ought to have been on whether the ceremony itself did or did not tick enough of the boxes of the 1949 Act to justify saying that it was only some of the formalities which had not been complied with. Therefore, the term non-marriage was unhelpful and the phrase non-qualifying ceremony was a better way of describing the event. And the court went on to elaborate this a little bit further. The human rights-based arguments rooted in the European Convention on Human Rights, which the first instance judge had used, had been flawed. Now, obviously, it is not inappropriate or improper for a judge to um, consider the European Convention of, of Human Rights, quite the reverse. Uh, he's required to do that or she is required to do that. But the particular way in which the court had interpreted the law in this occasion um, was flawed. First of all, um, the argument that Article 12 required the court to take into account the husband's failure to honour his promise did not, as far as the Court of Appeal concerned, make any sense. Article 12, of course, is the right to marry and to found a family. And the Court of Appeal said, yes, that's true, but the Convention imposes obligations on states, primarily, not on private parties. And it wasn't the state which was interfering in this woman's right to marry and found a family. The thing which was frustrating her uh, attempt to marry according to civil law was her partner, was the husband's consistent refusal to go ahead and to do that. The issue was not that there were government officials, public authorities or legal provisions getting in her way. And the court also pointed out that, look, Article 12 provides you with the right to marry and to found a family. It doesn't necessarily provide you with a right to 
financial compensation. And actually, in saying that you had a void marriage isn't providing you with a right to marry. By definition, a void marriage is not a marriage. It is a failed attempt to marry. Therefore, saying you have a void, failed attempt to marry isn't really furthering your Article 12 right to actually marry. So, for all of these reasons, the Court of Appeal felt that the Article 12 arguments were simply mistaken. The judge at first instance had also referred to Article 8, the right to private and family life. And again, the court found that the way in which he used and interpreted Article 8 was misguided. They accepted that Article 8 would be engaged on these facts. However, they took issue again with the judge's approach in having looked at their relationship in the round, their life together, and having taken the focus away from what happened at the ceremony in question. Was it a qualifying ceremony or not? Did it come within the provisions of the legislation? They said that it really wasn't relevant to think about um, what the couple might have promised to do in the future. In this case, the fact that the husband was saying effectively, we'll have an Islamic marriage for now, and at some point in the future, we'll also have a marriage in civil law. Neither was it helpful to get into uh, events which, at the time of the marriage, were just pure speculation. Um, children were, in fact, born into this relationship, but neither of the parties could know for absolute certainty that that was going to happen, that things would work out like that at the moment in time when they went through the Islamic marriage, which was the ceremony on which the wife was seeking to rely and was seeking to base her claim to have at least a void marriage. So again, for all of these reasons, the court said that Article 8 is not going to justify finding that you have a void marriage on these facts. So from your point of view, where does this leave us? First of all, we are back to a situation in which it is clear, unless the Court of Appeals decision is reversed in due course, but for the moment it is clear that if all the parties have done is to go through a religious marriage, which is not the kind of religious marriage recognised by civil law in England and Wales, then they will not be recognised as having a marriage, a voidable marriage, or even a void marriage. They are in the same position as any other two people who are merely cohabiting. There is no possibility of them accessing the financial relief provided for in the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973. Secondly, the term non-marriage has now been criticised by the Court of Appeal. This does not mean that it is wrong for you to use this term in your answers. It is a term which comes from case law, which has up until now been the appropriate and dominant term to use to describe this particular kind of situation. However, if you use it, it is important to refer to this case and to make it clear that you know and understand that the courts, or at least this Court of Appeal, has criticised the term and prefers the term non-qualifying ceremony. Having looked at the practical implications of this decision, what about the question of the merits of the ruling? In what ways is it positive? In what ways 
is it concerning? In terms of the negative aspects, clearly it leaves a lot of people in an even more vulnerable position than they were before. The first instance decision had sent some hope to uh, people, particularly women, but not exclusively so, who were married according to the rights of their religion, but not according to the provisions of civil law. It gave them some possibility of access to financial relief when such a relationship broke down and they're now left without even that route. I don't think that many people would deny that that is a concerning situation for our society to deal with. However, there are questions about whether it is a situation which was most appropriately dealt with by the decision here at first instance. And I would suggest that probably on balance, the Court of Appeal is correct here, that they took a preferable line and that one way or another, it is going to be for Parliament to decide what we do about marriage going forward. Why do I think that? Well, taking a step back, think about the regime that we have in terms of marriage in general. Point number one, there is a good case for reforming marriage law far more widely. Our framework of marriage law and our way of dealing with religious marriage at the moment is very complicated because it has evolved in a piecemeal way. Parliament has seen one particular situation which is problematic, has dealt with that, but at no point really has it taken a big step back and tried to reform the system as a whole. So we're left with a complicated uh, situation in which there are effectively four different types of legally recognised marriage in England and Wales. First of all, there is marriage according to Anglican rites and ceremonies, um, the Church of England or the Church in Wales. This is the oldest type of marriage for these purposes recognised by civil law. The Church of England is the established church. It is the religious body with a particular relationship with the state. Until um, the 20th century, the church in Wales was part of the Church of England, which is why you have a slightly strange situation with Wales. But basically, Anglicans, whether they are in England or in Wales, can carry out legally binding marriages because they are the official church for these purposes, and they have been since Henry VIII and the Reformation. Secondly, we have marriage ceremonies according to the rights of the Jews and the Quakers. Now, these two groups were given um, an exception because historically, Jewish people and Quakers were two recognised religious minorities in England and Wales before there were many other religious minorities around. So essentially, Parliament and society looked around and said, it's rather unfair expecting these people to either marry in a Church of England church or not to have a legally recognised marriage. So we'll make special accommodation because we've noticed that we have these two um, particular groups living amongst us, which was a fairly open-minded stance for the 18th century, to be fair. Thirdly, we have the possibility of civil marriage, of a marriage without any religious connotations, which is carried out and administered by the state, something which was implemented in the 19th century. And then fourthly, you have other forms of religious marriage. Any faith group that has a building which is capable of being registered for public worship 
and is prepared to take on the administrative burdens involved, is in a position, if it wants to do so, to carry out legally binding marriages. So there are mosques, there are temples, there are churches belonging to other Christian denominations which have chosen to put themselves in a position where they can carry out legally recognised marriages if they want to. The issue is that in the particular case we're looking at, um, the mosque and the imam in question had not chosen to go down that route. Now, that isn't to criticise them for that. There is absolutely nothing wrong. Lots of people of lots of religious persuasions choose to have a marriage which they know is a purely um, religious, spiritual, emotional affair and then quietly go either before or afterwards um, to have a civil ceremony to make sure they have something recognised uh, within state law. So effectively though, you have a situation now where there are four different routes to achieving a legally binding marriage. And from our current point of view, for our current purposes in terms of the merits of this particular decision, it is reasonable to ask, surely Parliament needs to have a look at this and one way or another streamline the system and that maybe judges fiddling around the edges simply is going to result with things being more confusing, increasing the uncertainty and perhaps even encouraging people to think, oh, now there's been this case about an Islamic marriage and the courts recognised it for some purposes, so it will be all right for me. Perhaps we are better off maintaining clarity until Parliament gets its act together and streamlines properly and reforms the administrative arrangements for getting married. A second and related point is that marriage is a very serious legal institution with major implications for the parties in terms of their legal rights, status, financial relief, inheritance, tax position, and all manner of other things. People need to have certainty about whether or not they are married. Whatever form of administrative arrangements the government puts in place have to be robust. It is not plausible, really, to imagine introducing a system where any form of marriage, as long as it was recognised by the religion of the parties in, involved uh, will be considered a valid marriage as far as state law goes. That simply isn't a viable proposition because you would create a system where it would be impossible to tell and to prove who was married and who wasn't married and that simply is not acceptable in the 21st century in our legal, social and economic context. So one way or another, whatever kind of reforming system you have, you need to have a method by which marriages are registered, by which people can prove that they are married and other people can discover whether they are married or not. Therefore, some kind of judicial intervention which opens the door to unregistered marriages being treated as valid marriages is concerning and instinctively feels like a bad idea. Another issue is that there is a point about the balance between autonomy and paternalism. In other words, the balance to be struck between, on the one hand, the state recognising that people have freedom, they have freedom of choice, even if sometimes they make bad decisions, immoral decisions, nevertheless, they have the right to dignity and freedom to do what they choose to do as individuals, on the one hand. And on the other hand, 
a recognition that there are some occasions in which it is right and proper and necessary for public authorities and the state to step in to regulate the dealings between human beings. Obviously, there is scope to disagree about where and when you should draw the line in this kind of balancing exercise in the context of um, marriage, but also in lots of other legal contexts as well. I don't think anybody would really read this case and deny that the husband sounds to have been quite a horrible person. He was abusive. He was dishonest towards his wife. Uh, he clearly misled her in the first instance about whether or not he was prepared to go through with a civil ceremony. He clearly applied all sorts of social and emotional blackmail to her, uh, possibly even physical violence as well. The court sounded to have been fairly convinced that he was lying to the court. He was not a nice person. However, generally speaking in our society, we don't take the view that it is appropriate for the law to step in and make people be nice, decent human beings in the sphere of private, romantic, family, sexual relationships. There are lots of situations where one convenient way of sorting it out would perhaps in theory to be to say, well, you know what? You should have married this person who was the co-parent of your children, who was doing the lion's share of childcare, who sacrificed their career. You ought to have done that and given them that protection, so we're going to treat you as though you did. I mean, it would be convenient. However, we recognise as a legal system that people have the right to make the choice whether or not they get married. And... People also have the right to make the choice whether or not they put themselves in a vulnerable position financially and economically. It's up to them. If we rescue the woman in ACTA, how do we justify not rescuing lots of other people in a similar situation? Also, supposing that the husband hadn't been such an unpleasant individual, but was simply somebody who had changed his mind about whether or not he wanted to get married. Does he also not have human rights? And actually, even allowing for the fact that he was an unpleasant person, the whole point of human rights is that you have them by virtue of being human whether or not you are someone we might think of as being likeable or good. We do normally recognise that you have a right to change your mind about whether you are going to get married up until the moment when you actually do. He knew that his religious wedding was not making commitments in civil law. Didn't he have a right to change his mind about making such commitments. If you take religion out of it, he wouldn't be the first person, male, female, gay, straight, whatever, to genuinely believe that they wanted to get married and then have a change of heart before they actually did it. Taking away people's right to change their mind is worrying and in one sense, you could say this was effectively what the judge did in this case in saying, well, you agreed to marry her at one point, uh, you didn't follow through, so we're going to treat you as having had a void marriage. It is effectively saying we are going to impose upon you the financial responsibilities which you took a very conscious decision to avoid. Also, in striking a balance between freedom and protecting the vulnerable, it is only fair and proper that the legal system attempts to strike a similar sort of balance in all cases. And if we had protected this particular woman in ACTA, we'd have to ask ourselves about all the people that we weren't protecting. She would have been protected 
partly because she was educated and partly because she happened to follow a religion. Women in a similar situation who had less understanding of the legal system or happened not to have been religious would still have been left without a remedy. Is that fair? Should your legal rights and protection depend upon things like your education or your religious outlook? What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, it was absolutely crucial in terms of understanding and education that this woman was well aware that she was legally vulnerable and kept pestering her husband to go ahead and make her his wife in civil law as well as in religious law. Had she not known that she needed to do that, then presumably she wouldn't have had such a strong argument that she had been trying to comply with the requirements of civil law. All that she would have done would have been to have gone through her Islamic marriage and just trusted and assumed that this was absolutely fine. Therefore, we are protecting a woman who understands the vulnerability of her position and is choosing to carry on in that position more than we're protecting someone who doesn't even know that they are in a very precarious position financially should their relationship break down. Does it make sense to protect the most vulnerable less than we're protecting someone who in many ways had a better opportunity to take care of their own interests. Turning to the religious point, again, the woman in this situation was fully aware that she'd had a ceremony which was extremely important spiritually and socially to her, but that as far as English and Welsh law was concerned, she was not married, nevertheless chose to carry on cohabiting. Imagine a woman or a man for that matter in a different set of circumstances. Somebody who happens not to be uh, religious in any way, but gets engaged to their partner, is planning on getting married in due course, but the couple discover that they're expecting a baby and they decide, all things considered, they would rather spend their money on the child than the wedding. They stay together. Maybe they've even had uh, an engagement party at some point in the past. They are socially, by all of their circle, acknowledged to be a couple in a serious relationship. They are together for a number of years. They have three children, but because there is no religious dimension to the situation, there's nothing that we can really hang a ceremony or claim for even a void marriage on should this relationship break down and should it leave one of the parties in an economically vulnerable situation because they've compromised on their career to do the lion's share of the childcare or perhaps to take look after an elderly relative or take a, um, a backroom role in a family business, whatever it might be. I am not suggesting that there are not real problems with the system as we have it. Quite the reverse, actually. Firstly, we do have a real problem with parties to religious marriage, often but not exclusively Islamic marriage, who assume and believe that they are legally married and only when their relationship falls apart do they discover that this is not in fact the case and that they do not have access to the secular courts to provide them with financial relief and protection in those circumstances. That is something which does need to be addressed, but there are pros and cons in various possible approaches to addressing it, and it is best done probably by Parliament, ad hoc decisions by judges, 
which appear to solve one immediate problem but open the door to lots of others and further injustice and inequality is not, I would argue, the best way forward. Similarly, I think there is a good case to be had that we need to debate our law around cohabitation, whether we are content to have the stark divide that we do at the moment between people who have a marriage or a civil partnership and are therefore in a position where the law will protect them, and people who are merely cohabiting and all of the financial relief available as far as the Matrimonial Causes Act is out of reach for them. It is reasonable to have a debate as to whether we want this binary black or white yes no situation to continue or whether we want to afford some cohabitees some relief in certain circumstances. Clearly these two problems are different problems but they are related and again it would make good rational sense to have a policy overhaul of the law about adult partnerships and adult relationships in general and for there to be a coherent response from Parliament rather than um, ad hoc responses from judges. So to say that on balance I am supportive of the Court of Appeals decision here in reversing um, the innovative stance of the trial judge does not mean I am suggesting that there is not a problem, rather it's questioning whether it is a problem that it is constitutionally appropriate or pragmatically useful for individual judges to try to solve. Moving on from this specific case to have a think about um, problems in the area of nullity more generally if you're answering a problem question in your exam. Firstly, as is always the case with problem questions, it is neither useful nor beneficial to include a long and complicated introduction with lots of background that is not of direct relevance to the facts that you're actually being asked to discuss. In a similar vein, don't feel that you have to repeat the, the facts of the problem question. Um, the examiner will have those in front of them. It just wastes your time during the assessment to reprise material that's already available. So don't do that. Feel able to get into the meat of your question fairly quickly. Explain the distinction between void and voidable marriage. Consider whether any of the grounds within section 11 might be applicable. Obviously, were they to be applicable, then the marriage would be void automatically from the beginning and it would be immaterial what anyone had to say or feel about that. Assuming that none of the grounds within section 11 apply, consider what might be relevant from section 12 in relation to voidable marriage. If there are grounds which look as though they might be relevant, even though there are good reasons why you would ultimately dismiss them, then it is useful and appropriate for you to work through and explain, even though this looks like it might be relevant for this, this and this reason, um, in the circumstances, it is not going to be an appropriate way of ending the marriage. However, if there are grounds which are clearly not relevant on the facts, for example, if neither of the parties has received a gender recognition certificate, um, there is no need to go into that particular ground in any great detail. If something is manifestly not relevant in the facts, do not spend time and attention focusing on it. Also, don't forget to consider once you have addressed uh, the grounds which may be applicable in your problem question, you should go back as well and think about whether there are any potential bars to relief.
I hope that this has all been of some help. As I said at the outset, I am still available by email, of course, if you have any questions about the material covered in this lecture. Thank you for your attention and stay safe. Thank you.